Welcome to California Community Church. I'm thrilled you're here and you've arrived on a special day. Wherever you're watching, whatever you're doing, I hope you'll really pay attention this morning because we're starting a four-week journey and I'm going to ask you to go on this journey with me. We're in a season of time where people have asked me many, many times, Brad, do you think God is trying to tell us something during this pandemic, during this crisis? And the answer is, absolutely. The problem is, we don't always know how to hear God's voice. So for the next four weeks, that's exactly what we're going to be learning together. How do we hear what God is trying to say? Now, that's a problem anyway. But I think in these days of working from home and if you're homeschooling your kids for the first time and if you're trying to home office with family members around, you know that your life is a bunch of noise. And in the middle of the clamor and in the middle of the cries and in the middle of phone calls and texts and emails, and then you add to that your personal anxiety and stress and the noises that just repeat and rerun in your head and the fears that occupy your heart, whew. How do you hear the voice of God in that? And if God's not shouting, can you hear him at all? Here's some questions we're going to be taking on. First of all, the basic one, does God even speak to me? And how does God speak to me? And will I know if God has spoken to me? And what am I supposed to do if or when he does? During this journey together, we're going to answer these questions and many, many more. Let me tell you what we're going to focus on. This is our focus. We will focus our attention on learning to get better at hearing God's promptings and to get bolder at doing exactly what he says to do. Now, if you're familiar with my teaching, you know what I try to do at the end is give you a bottom line, like sum it all up in a sentence or two. But today... I want to give you the bottom line right at the top. Here it is. It's important to hear the voice of God if we want our life to be led by God. Now, let's say that together. It's important to hear the voice of God if we want our life to be led by God. Now, if we want our life to be led by God, we probably need to have a pretty good idea what's been leading our life up till now. So what's leading your life today? Just imagine that we were on a Zoom call. And right now, online, we're having close to a 1,000 people, something like that, watching and participating in our uh, experience every Sunday at Cal Church. If we had all of your faces on a big computer screen, and if you had to get really honest with yourself, and each of you go one at a time and say, this is what's leading my life. This is what drives me. This is kind of my operating system. What would you say? For some of you, I think, If you were honest, you would say that other people's expectations is what drives your life. You look back over your life and you kind of see that pattern. Maybe you weren't necessarily athletic as a kid and you endured endless involvement in various sports leagues, not because you wanted to, but because your parents expected you to. Or maybe you didn't particularly care for science and math, but you ended up majoring in pre-med because that's what your mother expected you to maybe who you married what house you bought what neighborhood you chose to live in I mean on and on if you look back over your life at every crossroads did you make your decision were you driven along by is the operating principle that led you the expectations of other people here's another one some people are driven by and led by a deep-seated competitive need to acquire and to climb What drives you is the push to have the biggest house, the latest car, the coolest TV, the smartest kids, the most fashionable clothes, the most impressive vacations, all because there's something in you that drives you to climb and acquire, and it's more. That's your operating system. Like, look at your life. What leads you today? Some are on what I would call the kind of autopilot approach. Like, let's just have the same day tomorrow that we had today. In other words, your personality style and what gives you the greatest comfort and how you make decisions is where's the least amount of risk, the least amount of change. So if I can keep normal, if I can keep things the same today as I had yesterday, and I can keep them pretty close to the same tomorrow, that's how I make my decisions, right in this space. And then there's the to-do list kind of people. You have your to-do list? 
What's hilarious for me as a counselor is to find a to-do list person married to someone who doesn't keep a list. I mean, I've heard that's hilarious. <clears throat> your life is led by the things that you have on your list. I get up in the morning. I know the first thing I'm going to do. I know 10 things I need to get done. And that drives you and leads you every day. A really close cousin to the to-do list kind of person is the person who is led by the clock. Or we could have even said the calendar. It's like you're governed by, what am I supposed to accomplish by noon, by next Tuesday, by the time I'm 35, by the time I retire? Like you have an end date and you have goals attached to that. I mean, I could go on, but do any of these approaches sound familiar? I mean, this is the basic question. What leads your life today? So for the next four weeks, I'm going to ask you to consider allowing your life to be led by something different. I want you to think about the possibility that God speaking to you could become the leader of your life and by his promptings or his whispers or his guidance, you live your life every day. I'm going to tell you a story today about a man who had his life completely changed in this regard. He'd lived his life one way his whole life. He loved doing it his way. He dogmatically did it his way. He had a firm perspective on what he thought was right and how he thought things should be done, and that drove him. And then one day, very unexpectedly and very suddenly, his life changed. You see, this man had been a zealot and he was very anti-Christian. As a matter of fact, he saw it as his personal responsibility to find Christians, to arrest, persecute, and sometimes even kill Christians in an effort to stamp out Christianity. This was in the first century. Christianity was just new and fledgling, and this zealot was an ardent enemy of Christ and Christians. And then I want you to see what happened. Look at his story. Meanwhile, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and that's what Christians were called then, the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now stop right there. A minute ago, he was named Paul. In this reference, he's called Saul, and I'll tell you why. Going into this experience, he was Saul. He comes out a new man, and God gave him a new name. And from that point forward, he was known as Paul. But at this moment, when he's traveling, he hears this uh, voice, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and Saul said, who are you, Lord? And I'm Jesus, he heard, whom you're persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, you go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place hands on him to restore his sight. Lord... Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem, and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell, fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. 
this passage contains a treasure trove of information as it relates to the skill of learning to listen to the voice of God in our lives. So based on the story we just read, I want to pull out several ideas and principles. Those of you who are watching online, you can see that uh, next to the chat box down at the bottom on a toolbar, there's a little section that says notes, and you can click on that and you can follow along on the notes. You can even print them. Here's the first point. God can speak to you even if you don't ask for it. So make a decision to listen. In other words, God has a way to get our attention. Can I get an amen? I mean, I have a feeling right now during this global crisis, people are listening or looking or wondering or are open to the voice of God like never before. But isn't it sad that it took this to bring us to a place of humility where we would open our heart and open our ears and be willing to listen to the voice of God. But here's the thing. God can even speak through that hard heart. God can even speak through those closed ears. And that's what he did to Saul. Saul's story is proof that God can speak to people even before they think that they want to listen. And the promptings of God, the voice of God, it can penetrate to the deepest, darkest heart. Remember, Paul was going to Damascus to persecute, to arrest, and sometimes even kill Christians. He went to do one thing, but God interrupted. God spoke to his life, and that changed everything. He went against Christians. He came out of that experience as a Christian. God interrupted Saul's journey, shone an impossibly bright beam on Saul, caused him to fall off his horse onto the ground in utter blindness. Have you ever heard the expression, you better come down off your high horse? Well, that's exactly what happened to Saul. He's on the ground, he's humbled, he's been knocked off his high horse, and listen, he's now open to hearing the voice of God. Let me ask you a question. Has anything like this ever happened to you? And what I mean by that, has God ever had to knock you down a notch or two? Has God ever had to do something dramatic to get your attention? Has God ever knocked you off your high horse or humbled you? Maybe it wasn't as dramatically as Paul, but you were humbled. God had your attention, and he began to change the direction of your life. I do think this pandemic Not caused by God, but I think it's used by God to speak to us. That's why we're learning to listen to him. Looking back, can you remember a time, can you identify a time in your heart, in your life, where you're battling back and forth with a decision? Part of you is like, I know the right thing to do, but part of you is like, but this is what I want to do. Maybe it was a habit that you were trying to break, wanting to break, but part of you wanted to keep one foot in. Maybe it was like selfishness, but something was tugging at your heart toward generosity. Looking back on it, can you understand? That was likely the prompting, the whisper, the voice of God. My encouragement to you today is don't force God to use dramatic ways to get your attention. Choose to open your ears and open your heart to heaven. Willingly listen to what God has to say to you. If you've never surrendered your life to him, this could be your day. You bend your knee before him. You bow your heart humbly before him. And you allow his will and his way to become yours. And you follow him. Then you tell Jesus from the deepest part of who you are, that you're ready to hear from him and obey what he asks. Let's keep going. Number two, obeying God has a ripple effect. Set the ripple in motion. This is the second key that we can take away from Saul's experience with God that day. As we're reading through that story, we learn that a man of God named Ananias heard God's whisper in his own life. Ananias only had a decision to make about obeying God because Saul, or Paul, had first obeyed God and gone into a certain city, to a certain street, to a certain house, and that set up the need for Ananias to obey. Saul obeyed, 
And the ripple effect was Ananias needed to obey. I want you to understand this story from Ananias' perspective. Here he is, he's minding his own business, but he's become aware of the fact that Saul is coming to his city to round up, persecute, and kill Christians, and Ananias is a Christian, and God says, go call Saul, or something like that. Can you imagine getting a prompting that the person who's come to kill you, God has an assignment for you to go and talk to them? Ananias must have thought, you've got to be kidding, but God was not kidding. I want you to see this sequence. Saul followed the instruction of God, and that set in motion a series of events where now Ananias has a decision whether or not to obey the voice of God. Here's the spiritual point. Even though it may seem God's plan for your life is about your life, it's never just about your life. Let me say it again. Even though it may seem God's plan for your life is about your life, it's never just about your life. Every time God does something for you, he's also doing more through you. That's called the ripple effect. Like God tossing a rock into the pond of your life and then what you do, the ripple of that spreads and it affects others. When God whispers, go ahead, Be generous. And let's just say you give to a good cause and you support maybe the work of God through a local church or you fund a project that touches a life. You have no idea how the act of your obedience in generosity is going to touch one life after another life after another life. Or let's just say you're struggling with something and God is speaking to you and you make a decision to obey the Lord. Maybe somebody's been watching your life. And they've also been struggling about obeying God. And they don't know whether they can trust Jesus with their life or not. But then they see you take that step of faith. And the ripple effect encourages them to follow Jesus also. You See how that works? Saul's obedience sat in motion Ananias' obedience. You just never know. How God might use your obedience to accomplish significant good in the lives of other people. Remember, it may seem like it's just about you, but it's never just about you. Which brings me to the third point. We never see the full picture of God's plan, so obey the part that you see. God doesn't always show us everything, but he does show us our part and where we're supposed to obey. So when Ananias said, okay, even though I think this man could be a threat to me, God, you've told me to go, I'm going to go. What happened, Ananias would have never guessed. Paul becomes a follower of Christ. The scales fall off his eyes and he can see. He's baptized that day. What Ananias did not understand is that this same man, Paul, would go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament of our Bible. Entire communities would be radically changed. The entire world would be impacted because of the life of Paul. And Ananias had a little part of this. Here's what I know. When you and I choose to follow the divine prompting of God in our heart, we are now on the greatest ride, the greatest adventure that life can offer. Nothing, nothing beats the profound fulfillment found by following Jesus. Nothing. Now you may be thinking, hey, I'd love to obey God's whispers, but I have a hard time hearing them. I'm not sure if it's what I'm thinking or if that's God speaking to me. I mean, how can I know? If you don't have a track record, a lot of experience in hearing from God, then this four-week series is for you. I hope you'll make a commitment to be a part of all four weeks of this because we're going to learn some of this together. How do we know? When a whisper, a prompting, a voice is from God. What I'm going to do very quickly is spend the rest of our time giving you five tests to know whether or not God is speaking. Five tests to know when a whisper, something tugging at your heart, is from God. Here we go. Number one, just ask. God, is this prompting, this impression, this whisper, this internal nudge from you? Just ask him. Ask God candidly, God, is that you? And what you can do, you can, you can like say, well, if that's God, 
and God is consistent and God never changes, is what he's asking me to do consistent with the character and the nature of God. God never changes. He's always the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if it's from God, it's going to resemble the character of God. Does that make sense? And so we just ask, God, is this from you? And the way we can ask that is, God, does this look like you? Is this consistent with who I know you to be? Number two, does this whisper line up with the Bible? We are blessed because we have the ancient Jewish scriptures. We call that the Old Testament. We have the ancient Christian scriptures. We call that the New Testament. And they both teach us how God behaves in different situations. Further, we have eyewitness accounts of how Jesus acted, reacted, what he taught, what he said, what he did, what he didn't do, how he lived. And Jesus showed us what God is like. So, if you think you're hearing from heaven, you want to begin pouring through the pages of the ancient scriptures. You might even ask, is what I think I should do something that Jesus himself would do? It's that old question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And we find that from the Bible. So, does it line up with scripture and what it teaches us about God and Jesus? Number three, is this whisper wise? In the ancient Jewish scriptures, we have a whole book of ancient Jewish literature called the wisdom literature, and one of those sections is called the Proverbs. And the Proverbs teaches us a lot about what wisdom is like. I want you to look at this. Proverbs says, wise people love knowledge. Wise people practice gentle speech. Wise people live blamelessly. Wise people follow a straight path. And then wise people do what is right and just and fair. How's that for a filter? How's that for a grid? I mean, we just walk through those. Well, is this gentle? Is this blameless? Is this straight? Is this just? Is this fair? For instance, if you say, you know, I think God is instructing me to cheat on my spouse. Or I think God wants me to fudge on my expense report or erupt in anger at my boss or ignore injustice when I see it. All we have to do is read through the Proverbs and ask ourselves the question, is this wise? Because God would never ask you to do any of those things because they're unwise and God will only ask you to do what is wise. Look at number four. Does this whisper align with who I am. In in other words, does this input, this prompting, this thought that we have seem to correlate to who God made you to be? Let me give you an example. One pastor told the story about a man who was so moved by the musical experience in his church, the singing, the instrumentalist, the band, all of that. He walked up to the pastor after the church. True story. So emotionally touched by this. He said, Pastor, I am now contemplating quitting my job as a successful stockbroker, and I think that I'm going to go full bore into Christian music. The man said, I really, really feel like that's what God wants me to do. Pastor, what do you think I should do? Here's how the pastor responded. He said, I waited until he finished his determined explanation of his new career, and then I threw a few softball questions his way. Like, do you have any musical training, I asked. And after some hemming and hawing, he said, no. Well, what about any experience singing or songwriting? I mean, was there ever a time in your youth you were drawn toward the arts or part of a band or musical in any way? Again, he said, no. The pastor said, do you even sing in the shower? And again, the man said, no. The pastor said, I looked at that stockbroker and I said, I'm not trying to burst any God-ordained bubbles here. But is it possible that you were simply moved in your heart by a very beautiful and powerful song and maybe God just wants you to reflect on that wonderful experience and not really upend your whole career to pursue something you have no wiring for, affinity for, or experience in? I often caution people from running headlong into things that they get very passionate about, but it doesn't fit who God made them to be at all. You see, like Paul in our story, 
First, he was Saul. What do we know about Saul? He was a zealot. He was passionate. He was knowledgeable. He was scholarly. And he was bound and determined to do what he believed was right. But that was all against the things of God. And when he turned, guess what he still was? He was still a zealot. He was still passionate. He was still a scholar. He was still determined to do what he believed was right. But now... It's on a path of following Jesus. God used his exact personality and his exact wiring and his exact experiences in life to give him his next step in life. The fifth and final filter for knowing when a whisper is from God. What do the people I most trust think about this prompting that I have received? Here's what we read in the wisdom literature again from Proverbs. Where there is no counsel... The people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. That word counsel from the Greek is a nautical term that refers to the steering of a ship. And what the wisdom writer is saying, when you're wise, you're going to have a lot of counselors and they will steer your ship off the rocks. But if you're unwise, you'll just go it alone, do what you want without really asking for counsel and ultimately you're going to crash your ship on the rocks. Now, I want to offer a few words of suggestion regarding how to choose good counselors when you're seeking advice. Here's the first. Be sure the advisors you seek out have been walking with Christ longer than you. In other words, you don't want to be further ahead than they are in the spiritual journey. They should be mature in their faith and committed to living their life in a God-honoring way. Here's another one. It helps if they know you well. Seek out advisors who've watched you do life for a while and who get what you're all about. Friends and family members who fit the bill will be able to instruct you regarding whether a particular whisper really does seem aimed at you or not. Let me give you one more. Find advisors who have proven that they handle the promptings of God with wisdom themselves. Find folks who've learned to listen for the voice of God and who demonstrate by their words and actions that they're faithful to do what God asked them to do. Best friend of Jesus was a guy named John. I want to read a paraphrase of something that John wrote centuries ago. Don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. Be sure that as you solicit input from other people, you do so from people who are the real deal. When you find yourself at a crossroads and you sense that God is leading you one way or another, step back from that situation long enough to ask, God, is this whisper really from you? Does it line up with your character? Is this whisper scriptural? Is this whisper wise? Does this prompting seem to align with the person you've made me to be? And do my closest friends agree that this is your voice directing me in this way? As we wrap up, I want to issue a challenge to you. Remember at the beginning I asked you, what leads your life today? And it was the expectations of others and all of those things we went through. Here's my challenge. What if you make a commitment today, just for a while, try it, and you allow God to be the leader of your life? You ask him to speak to you. You listen intently for his nudges, for his whisper, for his direction. You check it out in the ways that I've said, but what you determine is, God, I want to follow you more than living my life led by all of those other things we talked about. God, I want to live my life led by you. I'd like to pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who spoke, not just in Bible times like in the ancient world, but thank you for being a God who is still speaking to us today. We love that you're present in our lives, and we do want to get better at hearing from you and heeding every ounce of wisdom that you give us. This week in particular, Lord, I pray that everybody who's a part of this community, everybody who's listened today, would have in their heart a desire to be an obedient follower of you. Men and women and kids 
who this week say, I'm going to prize hearing from heaven above any other goal this whole week. Father, I pray for you to speak to them. I pray that they'll have ears to hear and hearts that are open. Lord Jesus, let us be people who impact the world for good this week as a result of being in tune with you, listening to your promptings, and then obeying what you've asked us to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.